Hey everyone, welcome back to the Camino Cafe. If this is your first time here, welcome for the first time. I'm so glad that you decided to join us, whether you are listening on the podcast or if you're watching us on YouTube. So I wanted to give a shout out first off, well, I should introduce myself. I'm Lee Brennan, if this is your first time. And uh, I've been walking the Camino since 2019. And I fell in love so much with the Camino that I actually moved to Spain. So now I'm living in Santiago and doing all the things that you can possibly imagine around the Camino. So I wanted to give a shout out though, as we get started to all of the sponsors that have been supporting me over, gosh, past two and a half years, I think the podcast has been going. And um, some folks have been with me since the very beginning, which I will mention. But um, first off, there's Camino Concierge, and that is Michelle. And she just puts out so much great information about the Camino. She has some really wonderful um, handouts that if you sign up for her newsletter, they're very, very helpful as far as what you need to pack and that sort of thing. Uh, Camino Confidence, uh, that's Carol, and Carol is running tour groups, and she's been getting just rave, raving reviews about uh, the tours that she has recently led, and she, she not only does ones where she leads them, but also she will help you plan one if you're walking solo and you'd like to have some help and advice. Camino Stella, um, that's Andrea, and Andrea has been doing uh, several different things, and ones I think you should really check out is uh, she's offering Camino or Santiago Stories. So when you get to Santiago, you can sign up and go on a kind of little uh, story walk with her where she shares things about Santiago that you probably wouldn't learn otherwise. So it's really fun. She also has created a bomb um, for your feet or for any other place that maybe is kind of hurting after your walk. And I use it just about every day. So it's a great product. And then we have a new sponsor, and that is Frank at Monument, Mo uh, Monument Moon Studios, and he creates beautiful jewelry that's all related to the Camino, and uh, you will see his link and everyone else's links on the show notes, and um, Michelle has been with me since the very beginning, and then Maria, who is sitting here with me now, has been with me since the very beginning, and then Maria, who is sitting here with me now, has been with me since the very beginning, and she is with Spanish for the Camino, that is her company, and uh, Maria and I, I think we first met during, well, yeah, I know we did, we met during COVID, and um, we finally got to meet in person a couple of months ago when I got to Spain, and it was like meeting somebody for a blind date, I was so nervous, because we have spent so much time together online, so Maria, at the this is your second time here at the podcast, and I'm so delighted that um, we're back together. You've got new stuff to talk about, and uh, so welcome. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for all the support you've given me over the past two years. Hi, and, and thank you for having me again. Oh, you're welcome. So um, we have so many different topics to talk about, and um, I guess we should first first say that you live in Spain, and I mean, you were born here, you grew up here. But it wasn't until you went away from Spain and came back that I think you kind of realized that the Camino was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so let's maybe start there and maybe share with everyone uh, if they haven't heard this part of your story. Let, let's start there. So kind of give us how that happened. Yeah, well, I was born in Pontevedra, which is on the Camino Portugues, kind of, let's say, three days walk from Santiago. And um, yeah, I, I grew up here. And of course, I've always known about the, the Camino. I actually have family in Santiago. So I used to go to Santiago frequently. And uh, yeah, but the Camino, yeah, we knew it was there, but it was kind of, I mean, it wasn't big at all. It was something that kind of maybe crazy people did, you know, when you heard that someone was walking the Camino all the way from uh, maybe from Roncesvalles, which is where people uh, traditionally start here in Spain if they're walking the Frances, we would look at each other like, my God, you know, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Yeah. That's a long yeah. walk. Totally. And uh, although we have the Camino Portuguese coming through town here, through Pontevedra, and we have a very famous church, the um, pilgrim church, um, um, Iglesia de la Peregrina. I never saw a pilgrim walking through town growing up. Mm, there were no yellow arrows, scallop shells, or any other, you know, indication that the Camino was going through town. And then after college, I, I went to Ireland 
and uh, well it was supposed to be for a school year I ended up staying there for 15 years and uh, I was teaching Spanish uh, you know during all these years and um, especially in the last couple of years when people came to the courses you know I always like to ask them why why do you want to learn Spanish what's your motivation and especially in the last couple of years most of them that joined a course a Spanish course the motivation was the Camino so they had either walked the Camino with no Spanish at all and at some point they needed to communicate with someone locally and they felt frustrated because they, they just you know they, they couldn't communicate what they needed to or people who were planning their first Camino and wanted to learn a little bit before they got to Spain so that got me thinking like wow really <laughs> is this so popular how come you know we in Spain were thinking that these people who walk the Camino must be a little bit, you know, there must be, I don't know, they're a bit strange. Yes. And I now think. I'm here, and now I'm here in another country, and all these people are learning Spanish because they, they have walked the Camino already, they want to go back, or they're planning their first Camino. So yeah, that, that got me thinking. And then shortly after that, I moved back to Spain. I moved back to Pontevedra, my hometown. And yeah, I saw a difference there. I mean, from before, um, like for instance, in the mornings where I was living initially, I would uh, go out early in the morning to bring my kids to school. And I had to walk short stretch of the Camino and it was early in the morning so every day every single day I would see at least a pilgrim so yeah. I was like looking mm, this is new <laughs> I never <laughs> saw one of these here before in the past and it's not just one one day something you know occasional but I saw them on a regular basis and um, yeah so I was um, thinking well this seems to have become quite popular while I was away <laughs> um, and um, yeah so I, I started to you know look at some information and, and actually some of the people who were walking through sometimes many of them they were not Spanish and looking a bit lost mm -hmm. and uh, you know they didn't, were not quite sure who to ask how to ask so then I remember you know, about Ireland and these people, um, you know, joining the courses so that they could learn a, a little bit and not feel like those that I was seeing now in, in Spain. And um, yeah, so that's, that's how the idea for Spanish for the Camino, for the blog, you know, um, started really when I came back and with my experience in Ireland with all these people interested in the Camino and then coming back and realizing that, yeah, okay, this is not just a few strange people who like to walk a lot. This is uh, actually, yeah, I'm seeing pilgrims here every day. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how, that how it started, yeah. I love that story because this is really a firsthand account of really the first time anyone on the show has ever, you know, you know, grew up in Spain, you grew up on the Camino Portuguese, you went to university uh, in Santiago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During your lifetime, you have seen the Camino grow in such popularity. Mm -hmm. And I'm even thinking that since you came back from Ireland to present day, minus our lockdowns, but I imagine right now you're probably seeing even more people than what you first saw back when you came back from Ireland. Oh, as yes. Far as right yes totally I mean I can where I live now I can actually see the Camino from my from my balcony yeah. uh, so I like in the mornings I I wake up and I go there and I look out the window at the balcony and and see how many pilgrims and I see pilgrims I mean today only I don't know I I couldn't count them there were so many just 
You know? yeah, almost everyone I've been talking to lately, including myself, seems that they're getting ready to walk the Portuguese route. So yeah, it's I becoming feel like very popular. Yeah, mm -hmm. very popular. Mm -hmm. So um, your first Camino, I can't remember now what year it was. So I'll let you mention that. 2019. 2019. So same thing, same year as me. Yeah. <laughs> so you decided to walk the Camino in Glass, a section of it with your family. So take us through how that happened. Were you guys already in that area for a vacation or what made you decide to do the Inglés first uh, versus no. walking out your door or, or was it the Portuguese? Do I have that wrong? No, no, no. You, you, you got it right. You got it right. Yeah, no, I, well, of course, once I started, you know, like seeing the pilgrims and, you know, got interested in the Camino and started the blog, then obviously the next obvious step was now I have to walk. Uh oh, you gotta walk. <laughs> I have to walk. Yes. Um, so I, the Frances, for some reason, didn't appeal to me. Still doesn't appeal to me very much. Really? Okay. Um, not particularly. I mean, probably I wouldn't mind maybe visiting or walking some parts, but as a whole, I don't know. I, I just it it, it, it wasn't. Calling me, let's say, yeah. yeah. So I, for some reason, again, I, I don't know why I was kind of undecided between the English and the Portuguese. I guess the Portuguese would have been the most obvious choice since I'm, <laughs> I live on it. But I don't know. I, I just decided I, I wanted to walk the English first. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I got, got my family involved. I say, hey, people, we're going to walk the Camino. <laughs> so basically, it was just a long weekend um, that the kids had a couple of extra days, you know, of school. So we went to Ferrol and we walked for three days. That's, that's yeah, how long we had. And then we got back home. So we right. walked from Ferrol to Betanzos. Okay. And so, that was the uh, end of February, beginning of March. Ah. <laughs> so we didn't see anyone at all. <laughs> then you walked with your family. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from my family, I mean we didn't see we didn't see pilgrims. We didn't even see locals out and about. I mean, it was just like ourselves <laughs> out there. I mean, that's kind of still a winter pil a winter pilgrimage, right? February, March in Galicia and the north. Yes, and the, the weather wasn't, we were lucky. We didn't get caught in the rain, but there was one day where we thought we might have to stop maybe at some point during the, you know, halfway through the stage and, and call a taxi because the forecast was really bad, not just for heavy rain, but very strong winds. Mm -hmm. And it was very windy. It was almost hard to walk at times because we had the, the wind in, in our faces. Uh, but the rain held off. It did rain a lot once we got to, to Ponte de <laughs> It was Good. raining all evening, heavy rain, strong winds, really, really bad. But then the following way, day, it was fine. So we could walk to Betanzos and it was a lovely day uh, and it was fine. Because your kids were just about teenagers? Nope, not yet. I think maybe 10 and 12. Okay. Uh, yeah, or 11 and 13. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. So you, you walk these first three days um, and then you decide to go back. So in those first three days, did you feel like, oh, I kind of see what these Irish people, why they were so um, interested in doing this? Or were those first three days, since it was so lonely out there and the weather kind of was still a little questionable, did it not catch you as far as being something you wanted to do regularly or, mm, or yeah I wasn't I mean it didn't put me off yeah it, just, it didn't put me off but but yeah I mean you heard people talking about all the meeting other pilgrims and friendships you made and all of this of course I didn't experience any of that because there was nobody out there to meet <laughs> 
Uh, but I said, well, I mean, it's just uh, just a different experience. I mean, yeah, maybe if, if I go some other time of the year when, you know, it's not so close to winter or I don't know, we'll pick a different Camino, um, maybe it will be different. So it, it didn't put me off. Okay. obviously yeah. well obviously didn't put you off but didn't put you in that position where it was going to be something that maybe you were going to build a whole business and do all this around so what made you go back and then do some more stages well i had i mean one of the reasons why i wanted to do it first was because i had already planned with another teacher to organize right. um like an immersion experience on the Camino and the other teacher she didn't know much about the Camino so she left all the okay choose the choose which Camino we're walking and those decisions to me and that's when you know I was undecided between the the Portuguese and the English one and once I decided the English one I said well I would like to go and see what's out there before I go with the group because the Portuguese, at least some of the places I'm a bit more familiar with, but not mm -hmm. so much with the English one. So, so yeah, that was, um, that was it. So I went with this other teacher and with this group of people in May, end of April, beginning of May of the same year, 2019. So we walked, yeah, from, from Ferrol to Santiago. Okay, and that was with your Spanish immersion pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I should tell everyone, I'm getting ready to go on one with you, and um, we'll be doing the Portuguese route. So I'm super excited to do that. So I guess now would be a good time to maybe talk about um, what do you do on the immersions, and how did you come up with this idea? And um, I, I know that you wanted to do it so badly during COVID, but you know we had to have a break, and that, that just didn't happen. But um, so this will be your first one since since lockdown, right? Mm -hmm. that will be yes. This fall. So could you maybe share with everyone kind of your philosophy, how it started and what you're hoping to do with this next one? Yeah, I, I had the idea, you know, here I was thinking things I would like to do in the future. I don't know when in the future. And I thought oh, it would be nice to maybe be able to walk the Camino with people who are learning Spanish, who want to improve their Spanish. But I, I didn't feel ready at the time to, you know, uh, do that on my own. And then this other teacher I knew online, we actually hadn't met in person, we just knew each other online. Um, one day she contacted me and, and we started talking and she was like, oh, I like this um, idea of the Camino. And yeah, I have some, some ideas of things I, I would like to do. And I said, well, I would like to do this, uh, but I, I don't feel ready yet. And she said, oh my God, that's what I was, you know, that's what I had in mind. That's what I wanted to do too. Uh, but she had experience organizing like immersion retreats in Spain in the same place. So I don't oh. know if the retreat was for four or five days. They were staying in the same place, same city for, for the duration of it not walking the Camino and staying in a different place every night, but she did have that experience. And um, so we decided to do it together. And, um, and, and we did, so we got, I think we had seven people that yeah. came. And um, basically the idea is, yeah, it's, it's an immersion. So speak Spanish, all the time and um, the conversation we did prepare beforehand some materials and we did have topics for conversation and all that but we didn't really need to use any of that because all the conversation just you know kind of flowed organically everything you know just happened naturally mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, basically we spent six days walking the Camino and speaking Spanish <laughs> and it was an amazing experience. 
I, oh. I wasn't, I mean, I had my doubts, um, many doubts <laughs> before we started because first of all, I'm an introvert. So I wasn't quite sure how, you know, having to spend a whole week with a bunch of strangers 24 mm seven. -hmm. And it's like, okay, I'm the teacher. Like I'm organizing this. I cannot just say, okay, people leave me alone. I need some, you know, like, <laughs> I need to be by myself. Um, I, I need to be available. So, so yeah, there, there were too many things going around in my head, but I mean, no, it was, it was an amazing uh, experience. Um, I really enjoyed yeah, it. That seems pretty typical though, right? We always have all these fears before we go out on any pilgrimage, yes. right? And usually it's not those things that mm. end up being the challenge for mm -hmm. us, whether you are just walking uh, as, a, as a pilgrim normally, or if you're leading a group, I would imagine it's probably kind of the same thing. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. So now this next time you're going to be doing the Portuguese route. So you've changed routes. So this will be the first time. Yeah, we there. should have done it in 2020, but as you know, we have, we have to cancel it. <laughs> Now, are there any spots still available? I know that you had said uh, possibly one at the moment. Uh, I'm waiting for someone's confirmation, but I don't think this person was not um, very sure that they could attend. So possibly there could be one one spot available. Yeah. Okay. Well, this episode will definitely be out. I think in plenty of time if they still wanted to sign up because the actual pilgrimage is the last week of September. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um. We, I will have a link to it, everyone, in, in case you have an interest. And if this timing's not right for you, I'm sure she's going to be doing more down the road. So you will make sure you have her website and, and all that information. So I guess let's um, kind of switch uh, directions here and talk a little bit about, so you you went on the Inglis and then you did the retreat and you already have the blog going and you're kind of, I guess, simultaneously developing Spanish for the Camino. And you know you know this, I tell you this all the time that I love your workbooks. I love the concept of what you're doing. Um, so I've, I've been very familiar the last two years, but I'm sure there's some folks that are gonna be listening or watching that aren't aware yet and are gonna be interested once they do here. So maybe share with us a little bit about um, some of the stuff you're doing with that and what your products are, that sort of thing. Well, I started, as I, as I mentioned earlier with the blog, so every post I, I write about something, well, obviously related to the Camino, the posts are in English because the idea is to help those who have no Spanish at all. So if the posts are in Spanish, obviously they, they wouldn't be able to read them. So the posts are in English, but they all contain, I don't know, between five and 10, usually between five and 10 Spanish words or phrases. And they all include the audio too. So you can listen to them because this is something that really annoys me about phrase lists. When you get a, you know, you go on holidays or something, they speak another language and you get a phrase list. And I look at them and I go like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? I don't know how to pronounce any of this. Mm -hmm. uh, if I try to pronounce it the way I would pronounce it as a Spaniard, they probably won't have a clue what I'm trying to say. And when they reply back, I'm not going to understand any of the answers either because I, I don't know how any of these words sound. So that was important to me to include the audio there. Uh, so that's, the, yeah, that's how it started. I mean, I, I do lessons too. I do one-to-one. -one. Sometimes I organize uh, groups mainly I've been organizing them for, for beginners. And um, um, well, the, the immersion, of course, which yeah, the idea would be to do maybe once, once a year, do one every year. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, yeah, the workbooks you mentioned, I, I, they're not available at the moment because I want to change a few things. But yeah, basically it was a collection of, six workbooks, um, each one focusing on, on a topic, topics that, you know, are all related to the Camino. So for instance, there was one about accommodation. So, you know, um, accommodation related vocabulary, how to ask for a room for, you know, or 
different things. Um, just accommodation in general, how to you know manage accommodation or another one about health you know if you have any health issues how to explain what's wrong with you or you know things like that what you need or not or you know if you need to go see a doctor and explain what what the problem is uh food ordering food and you know things like that um yeah well there were six in total i'm kind of improving them i think anyway that that's the idea to improve them already i don't can't even imagine what you're going to do to them i just want to change a few things around you know i mean i have to update a few things for instance in the, the health one uh with the pandemic i did include add an extra section on kind of pandemic related vocabulary that was quite relevant at the time but at the moment it's not so relevant anymore so i probably just take those out and maybe add something else so yeah I just just wanted to um, update it and improve them a little bit and then recently I I published a short novel in Spanish um, easy Spanish for kind of beginners I mean again not if you're a total beginner but for beginners it's it's easy um and it's, um, yeah, it's a story set on the Camino. And yeah, it's a, a person, a woman's uh, experience on the Camino Inglés. Uh, so it covers, again, all the topics. This woman has to, she's not Spanish, so she has to um, go and find accommodation. She needs to go and, I don't know, buy train or bus tickets and needs to order food at a restaurant things like that and of course there's the story of you know people she meets and, and what happens and and all of that too in the story well i've been reading the book and um so I, do you have a copy of the book with you because mine is on yeah i have it here I so, it. so it's not okay. a, it's, it's not it's not huge and you know print is kind of big uh, so yeah and you have every every chapter has a few um a short list of words the kind of hardest in the chapter and you have them all uh, listed at the back um hold um, up the hold it up again maria so people can see the cover and tell everyone the title mi primer camino de santiago because it's this woman's first uh, experience on the Camino. And so it's about 20 chapters long, I believe, right? 20 and chapters, then... yeah, short chapters, okay. If you can see the book there, you can see it's not a huge book, so each chapter is a couple of pages. And I loved, I, I really loved how you weaved in your, so Emma, our lead in the book, is from Ireland, so I was like, this is great. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and I really love how you just weave everything in about the Inglés and, you know, how there's a lesson. And it's almost kind of like reading a, a Camino memoir while also um, learning Spanish at the same time. So you're learning about the Inglés, um, also about a first pilgrim experience and, and a typical experiences, like you said, mm -hmm. and then also getting some Spanish practice. So it was a very clever how you put all that together. Thank so, you. Um, so I guess let's go back to um, you started writing this uh, probably like last year. I mean, I know the idea had been percolating for a while. Yes. When did you actually sit down and say, you know, I'm going to do this book? Yes, the idea, well, not for this book in particular, but I've always liked the idea of writing books for for Spanish students because, well, for two reasons. First, me as a language learner, I enjoy reading stories in the languages I am learning. And also I've used stories with my students in the past and well, I still use them, but it's, you know, they work. It's a, it's a nice way of, of learning. So, but you know, sometimes, stories that are out there it's like, this is not exactly what I want so it's like maybe I should write my own so I can include there whatever I want so I had that idea probably 
more than 10 years ago. Wow. And, and I did actually start writing probably two, three times back then. Nothing about the Camino, it's just something else. But yeah, I didn't have a clear plan. I wasn't quite sure. Okay, just knew that I wanted to write a book, but I didn't really know what I wanted to write. So anyway, that, that was left in there. Probably a, every now and then I find notes for that <laughs> book <laughs> still <laughs> in the house. Um, so nothing happened with that. But this idea of writing a book kept coming back. Every now mm -hmm. and then I would think about it again. Oh, the book. Yeah, I should write some book. When I finished working the uh, English, um, although I know some people would say or think that you have to walk like a, for a whole month to get the, you know, the, the full, I don't know, Camino experience or the effects of the Camino, I disagree. I think you can you can get that in a week. I agree. Um, no problem. I I walked for a week with this group and and actually yeah I I thought it would be okay. This is just you know something I'm doing for work with these people. I don't know um, Santiago. Okay, it's not like so many people like maybe you the first time you had never been to Santiago you know you get there for the first time and it's so exciting I mean I lived in Santiago for three years when I was in college I was sick and tired of walking in front of the cathedral <laughs> across the you know the square and everything so you know it, it wasn't anything new or right. you know exotic for me but still getting to Santiago uh, at the end of the Camino was, you know, was quite an emotional uh, experience. And yeah, you, know, you and I talked about that. It kind of surprised you because yes, like you totally. said, you went to school here. I mean, you grew up near here. Yeah. yeah. You went to school here and you weren't really expecting no. the emotions no, no. that you felt. Let's talk about that a second. Um, yeah, no, that was like... Uh, yeah, no, I wasn't expecting that. I thought like, okay, it's just another day in Santiago, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, nothing new here. But no, like, I mean, the last day was so hard. It was a short day because it's only around 16 kilometers, I think. First, it felt like forever. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it's like, where is Santiago? Are they moving it further and further away? Why are we not there yet? <laughs> but on the other hand, it was like, oh, I don't want this to finish. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was having such a great time, enjoying so much, you know, talking to these people, getting to know them, becoming friends, you know, uh, that I didn't really want it to end. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was uh, quite an emotional experience to get to Santiago and uh, if I'm finishing you know, this Camino. So yeah. yeah, then I went home and I was like, you know, trying to adjust uh, mm -hmm. back to normal life. So I did start writing a bit, not again, not the story, but just just thoughts and things, you know, just just writing for the sake of, of writing. And uh, so again, this idea of the book came back again <laughs> and it was becoming stronger, coming back more frequently. Um, I did try to start writing it and I did actually, in fact, write probably seven or eight chapters maybe but then I got stuck again mm. and um, yeah, I was like, oh, what can I do and then I just one day I said okay no I need to do something I I met some um, writing coach mm. and she had some a couple of things she first of all she had some you know uh, like a document with a few different things to 
get you organized before you actually start writing. So mm. get your get your plan, you know, first and outline your your book and all the things you want to cover. So I did that. I so I had more or less, although I did change it later, but I had, you know, all the chapters outlined. Okay, chapter one, this is what I want to write about, chapter two, three, and so on. And then I joined uh, like a writing marathon just to get me started. So it was like four hours <laughs> of writing. <laughs> um, this was online. Uh, so it was in a group. So at the beginning of um, the hour, you have to say, okay, what your goals for the next hour were. And then at the end of the hour, we all come back and say, okay, did you achieve your goals or not? So I, yeah, I wrote there, it was four hours. I wrote the first four chapters. Oh, now, how did you find um, the writing coach? Um, someone recommended it, her to me, uh, yeah. a friend uh, who is also a teacher was following this, uh, this coach already and um and said oh look uh, she's organizing this writing session and all that because she knew i i wanted to write this book so this might interest you and i said sure why not i need to do something needs to change here i'm going to be stuck forever so so yeah it was just a friend who recommended her so are you glad that you did that process? Did yes, yes, because, you know, once I, I managed to more or less uh, finish those four chapters there, that, you know, gave me some momentum just to keep writing. So I actually, after that, I kept writing. And every day I would try to find at least some short period of time to write a little bit more. So I just kept going, kept going. Then when I was almost finished, because I said fears kicked in again. <laughs> right. So I stopped when I had two chapters uh, left to finish. And um, so I, yeah, everything stopped there for a while. And then uh, everything else was, yeah, was, was finished. I just needed the last two chapters. Mm. And uh, so what I did, um to get over that <laughs> i'm in a group with uh, other uh, spanish teachers and um, i told them guys give me a date to finish this book okay you set the date and if you give me the date and i say i will do it then i will do it um because i i said here in public <laughs> i committed to this so now i have to do it so they gave okay. me a date and, and yeah, I finished it <laughs> before that day. <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, from somebody that has observed a lot of what you're doing and putting out into the world, um, it's not like you're, it's not like the book was your only project. I mean, you wrote this while you were still working on Spanish for the Camino and doing your regular blog posts. I mean, you're very consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, in getting information out and educating everybody in the Camino community. You're very active in um, supporting pilgrims that are asking questions on the various Facebook groups. You're doing private lessons, you're doing group lessons. I mean, you're a busy gal and you've got a family, right? So um, you really did juggle a lot of things at one time as you were doing this book. So uh, kudos to you. Like, I'm so impressed that um, you, you got this book out into the world. And um, I should say to everyone that it's available in Kindle and in hardback or soft cover book, right? And did you self-publish? I'm assuming you did. You and I yes. never really discussed that part. Yeah, so you saw did, yeah. What Did you find that difficult? Well, I had a few technical issues, but um, yeah, Amazon is not very helpful. I mean, you, you have to go through so many <laughs> different things. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't make it easy for you, but I mean, it, it was it was okay. I mean, just uh, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, I mean, did you even have photos in the book? I mean, you, you've got a lot going on in the book, so 
Okay. So, um, you know, if we look at if somebody's sitting at home right now and they have walked the Camino, what tips would you give them if you had to say, okay, if I had to rewrite this book, here are maybe two or three things that I would have done differently, just to kind of give people or things that you would have done again uh, that would help people in, in getting their book out into the world? For me, the planning uh, before I started was essential because I think the reason or I think I'm convinced the reason why I never finished the other hundred times I started was because I didn't have a clear plan of what I wanted to write. I have a vague idea but not a clear plan and this time yes I had on a page like a, an outline of the book, each chapter. Okay, this is chapter one. As I said, as I was writing, I ended up changing it. It was my original plan was for 15 chapters. It's now 20. So I added some extra, I had to rearrange a couple of things. Um, but at least, you know, I mean, you have to be flexible. Uh, but I had a plan and that was... I'd say for me, probably the most important thing, having that plan. And it also helped this kind of kickstart, you know, the, the four hour session, because mm -hmm. at least I saw, you know, I had the plan, so it was easy. I know what I'm going to write. Um, those seven or eight chapters I had written before, I ended up not using them. So it's completely different. Okay. So I changed a few things, but yeah, getting that start, um, at least you see, okay, I've made some progress, I've made progress, and I have a plan. So now I just have to look at my plan. What's the next chapter about this? Okay, let me sit down here and try to find every day an hour or, or even if it's less, but just, you know, just keep it going. Because for me, at least, it's like... It, if I stop and leave it for let's say, a week, then it becomes harder to get mm -hmm. back to it. But if you keep it going, it's like, yeah, your things are rolling. Yeah, you, you keep writing. Okay, and, I mean, if it's only a couple of lines that I write today, but at least I get the feeling that I'm making some some progress. Yeah. Um, so kind of like that, a that Camino, right? hmm? step by step, step by step on the Camino, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 You don't have to do it all at once, uh, but at least, yeah, just get the momentum and, and keep going, you know, uh, even if it's very slowly. Yeah, even when it gets hard and all the things, right? <laughs> so I'm wondering, Maria, you know, somebody's probably listening here um, and thinking, yeah, you know, I, I, it would, why should I learn Spanish, first of all, to walk the Camino? Um, and then from your experience in you, you've been giving lessons for so long and you have literally walked with people in an immersion situation. What, what do you think is most challenging for English speakers trying to learn Spanish? What are the common things that you see and how could they go about working on those couple of things? Well, one thing I think people sometimes overlook is the pronunciation and it makes all the difference because if you're pronouncing things wrong, even if you know the words, but if you're mispronouncing them, people might not understand you unless they're used to dealing with, with foreigners, mm -hmm. uh, talking to people with strong foreign accents. Uh, so that that's something, yeah, I would probably, and that's why, you know, I mentioned earlier that have the audios uh, for all the words that are in the blog. That was important for me for, you know, for that reason. Um, but then my advice is don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares if your grammar is not perfect people will appreciate any effort you make to speak the language so that's that's it i mean just uh, just try even if it's only a few words that you can learn before you get to spain i'm sure you will pick up a few more while you're there you know if, if you try 
Um, but don't don't be afraid. You know, it doesn't matter if if it's not perfect. If you, your grammar is, um, you know, it's a mess. <laughs> Nobody is going to be judging you on yeah, how correct your grammar is or anything like that. They're just going to appreciate that you make the effort. So, and you get so much more out of it because you know you see people sometimes, um, you know, uh, well. The ones you see here who are totally lost and <laughs> don't know who to ask. But apart from that, then you, you see or you read, I should say, um, comments on like Facebook groups or you know things like that. The people they just they, they they get things totally wrong, you know, about uh, Spain because they come with their ideas, so they see everything through those beliefs those are ideas they have and which might be incorrect but because they don't talk to anybody they don't um you know they, they don't interact with anyone local they go back home with the same misconceptions and um, and it's a pity you know because you're in the country it's a great opportunity to not just walk but learn about the country about the, the culture the history mm, yeah everything i mean you're there what better place to learn than you know maybe read it on a book no you're there you can live it and and you're missing that opportunity yeah i totally agree and i i can attest to the fact that um you're absolutely right you know when i'm while living here in spain you know i'm still working very hard to try to learn spanish but uh, even when I make many mistakes, when I go into a restaurant or a store, uh, everybody is so kind to me and they'll just be like, Tran tranquilo, tranquilo, poco, poco, you know, like no one expects us to speak fluently on the mm -hmm. spot, but I think when they sense uh, that we're making an effort, um, I find that if they do speak English, many times they will switch to English for me. And sometimes I'm like, no, 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 please, please stay in Spanish. Um, but uh, I, I think I definitely see um, that uh, they feel good about uh, the fact that we're at least trying, you know, and, and um, not expecting somebody to speak back to us in our language, but attempting because we are in Spain. <laughs> and I think showing the respect that we are in your country and um, that we're at least trying, I think makes the interactions so much more pleasant and you end up learning a lot more uh, mm -hmm. about the culture and about the people that live here, which then takes it all back to, we're all the same when it comes down to it, right? Um, we just speak a different language, but we all have the same concerns and the same desires and interests and, and things like that. Um, and, and you won't learn that if you aren't able to have some simple exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, you write so many helpful posts and you've had uh, some really popular ones out there. Do you want to share maybe any recent um, things? You had a rant recently and then you've um, been educating on many different things. There was something about the siesta. There was something about uh, the grocery store. <laughs> Don't get me started on the siesta. <laughs> Those comments really trigger me. Um, I, have a, I, have a, I know I have a problem with the siesta. Um, I think we should talk about it because I think, you know, that has been something new to me in living here. I didn't notice it as much as I was walking, you know, other than, you know, I'd have to make a mad dash to make sure I, you know, I get somewhere before the pharmacy closes or things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think we should kind of maybe just use this last little bit of our time to kind of just talk about maybe educate us on the whole concept of the siesta and, and what it really is about um, versus, I think, the stereotypes that are out there today. Yeah, I mean, the stereotype, and I think that's what, you know, uh, what I, I don't like, <laughs> just gets me a bit, a bit angry, is the fact that it's like people think that in Spain, we, I don't know, uh, maybe around noon or 1 p.m., we just go to bed and sleep for three, four hours <laughs> in the middle of the day when really nobody does that okay um siesta i mean it makes sense uh first of all what people um on these forums and stuff 
when they talk about siesta, really what happens is what we call not siesta, but lunch time, right? Uh, lunch is the main meal in Spain. And as you probably, you all know, and you have experienced, we eat lunch late. I mean, there's some, you know, historic reasons why that is the case. Like we're in the wrong time zone. We, we shouldn't be in the Central European time, but same time as Portugal and the UK. But anyway, thing is, our lunch is late and it's the main meal of the day. So unless you live in a big city like uh, Madrid, Barcelona, somewhere like that, where maybe you have to commute, you have a long commute and it's not worth for you to go home and have lunch. If you live in a smaller place, people they finish work, they go home, they have lunch, big lunch, and then they go back to work. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening during those maybe three, four hours. And that's why shops are closed. And yeah, most, mostly everything is closed because people are going home to have lunch with their families. Mm -hmm. And uh, tops, they take a short nap, which is like, okay, you sit down on the sofa and doze off for 15, 20 minutes and, and that's it. But nobody is sleeping for three, four hours. You also have to keep in mind, because I've read comments of, um, and this was in the summer. This is why, you know, it's, it's relevant that it was during the summer that the person wrote the comment because there's like, yeah, I went out uh, in this town, I don't know, whatever town they were in, and it was deserted because, yeah, everybody's having siesta till, I don't know, seven or eight. I said, no, people, <laughs> this is the summer. It's very hot. Who in their right mind is out and about walking around the city at four, five, six p.m. when it's maybe 40 degrees outside <laughs> it's roasting no you stay somewhere in the shade or if you're near the, the coast you go to the beach or you go to a pool or you just stay somewhere where you can be fresh it doesn't mean that because you don't see the people outside it doesn't mean that they're in bed sleeping for five hours in the middle of the day it's yeah. just you know and, and siesta made sense in the past, especially, you know, in the country where, I mean, you, the farmers, they couldn't go out and work mm -hmm. at 2, 3 p.m. They would probably die of a um, heat stroke if they did, yes. especially in, in some parts of Spain. So that's, you know, that's why people are, you don't see people out. And mm -hmm. If it's the summer, it's hot. People stay in or yeah, go somewhere where they can be a bit cooler until, you know, it's not so hot outside. People are home having lunch with their families. We're not sleeping three, four, five hours in the middle of the day. No. And, you know, if you think about it, it's kind of like the way that we walk the Camino. We, we tend to get up early. We want to be in the towns by like, you know, two o'clock, one o'clock uh, before it's getting really hot, especially in the summer, because yeah. it, it's harder to walk. And, um, and you're right. I mean, most of the uh, advice that I've read about that the siesta part is really just that tiny little bit of a nap um, that maybe is, it's never really in your bed. It might be sitting in a chair, maybe just on the sofa, sofa, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a small rest. And, um, uh, and what I've learned really is it was an adjustment for me in, in moving here and that things were closing earlier, but it's really nice on the other hand that things open up again later once it's cooled off, you know, and so it's not that you can't get the things that you need. Uh, it's just learning um, when you can get them. Yes. <laughs> you just need to change your schedule. Yeah, exactly. And once you begin to adjust, now I really love that twenty minute, just kind of closing my eyes because again, lunch is that big meal of the day, and then we're staying up pretty late mm -hmm. uh, for dinner, and so it's nice to have had just a few minutes with the eyes closed. Um, but yes, no one's napping for three and four hours a day, and. Yeah, and people are going back to work after that. So 
even yeah. if they did, they're still working a full day. It's yeah. just that the day is broken up differently than what it might be in the UK or in mm -hmm. the United States. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's really great, Maria, when you're out there um, correcting people and and trying to um, you know educate people about you know what it's what life is really like in Spain. So I, I know that you're super appreciated in all the groups and. You know, it's time and time again, I see when somebody's like, oh, I want to learn Spanish, your name comes up all the time. And um, you've certainly been a big help to me and to the community here. And um, I'm just so glad that, that your experience in life uh, brought you back to the Camino so that you can be a part of all of this and, and, and be uh, an ambassador and a leader on the Camino. I think it's, it's definitely needed and you are definitely serving an important role there. So... Wow, and congratulations on your book. Um, I'll make sure that I have the links um, to the book uh, and show notes, and I hope everyone gets out there and reads it. I, I'm certainly gonna be using it on this walk that I'm going on for the, I won't be on the English on this upcoming walk. I'll be in Portugal, but still the same word, well, not in Portugal, but I'll be on the Portuguese. Uh, so I'll still be using Spanish. And then, of course, I'm going to be um, walking the Inglés. And uh, oh, there's one more spot maybe left on the immersion. So if you want to come and um, join Maria, um, I'll be doing that immersion with her. And I can't wait to do that. And um, wow, thank you for coming back. It's always a pleasure to have you here at the Camino Cafe. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you're welcome. And I, you know, I just want to ask everybody, if you enjoy what we're doing here at the Camino Cafe, please share this interview. Help us get the word out to folks that especially the people that are walking for the first time um, let them know about this interview and that they're wanting to learn some more Spanish to enhance their experience while walking that there's a resource in Maria and uh, hopefully they will seek her out so I'm just going to say goodbye to everyone Maria stay on so you and I can say goodbye and uh, we'll be back uh, very shortly with another episode with Camino stories and other things that you can learn about the Camino so thanks for coming everyone